Okay, we got several prayer requests. Um, we need to remember uh, Mike McAllister. I uh, just transferred him up to CAMC today for heart issues. No. couple of requests. Um, Mike McAllister, um, Tommy and Bill Chapman are, Tommy's going to Morgantown on the 21st for testing, and Bill Chapman goes in about three weeks for testing in the back of his heart, so uh, I need to remember those three. Um, also, if you look on the right-hand column, I have a cousin there named Tom Taylor. Uh, he had cancer. Um, he's now going Friday for take his gallbladder out, so remember him as gallbladder surgery. Yeah. Um, and that's all I have. Anybody else have any? Bob? Okay, he's right here, yeah. Anything else? Anybody else?
me? Um, I forget. Um, there's a Pastor Kevin and Lisa. And our messengers. You're going to Princeton, West Virginia. What name? I'm sorry, Chuck, I didn't hear. Yes. Tammy's mom. Go to prayer and and I'll close, okay? Father, thank you for today, and just uh, thank you for what you've done for us today, uh, for just us just being able to be here this evening, and thank you for that, uh, being able to get up, get out, get around, uh, it's a blessing from you. Father, we have so many new on our prayer request list, and so many others. We pray for those who have already been on the prayer list. We pray that you'll answer each and every one of those according to your purpose. Um, Father, we come to you for uh, Bob Gibson. 
he has a mass on his bladder. We pray that you would uh, heal him if it be your will. Uh, Father, we just ask that your perfect will will be done in that life. Uh, Father, we pray for Ken. He has swelling in knees. It's hard for him to walk. We pray that you would be with him, ease the pain, help the doctors to find out what's wrong, and so he can get around and, and get back and be here with us. Uh, for Tom in Bedford, Father, we pray for him as he's been through so much with his cancer. Uh, we pray that now that as he goes into surgery on Friday for his gallbladder, that you will direct the doctor's hands. Uh, as they remove the gallbladder, uh, that you would be um, in that situation. Father, for Frank and Penny Wingo, uh, for Penny who suffers from dementia, and for Frank who's been faithful to be with Penny, uh, Father, we pray to give Frank strength uh, as he goes every day to be with Penny. Father, we just pray that you would uh, be with them, be with both of them, help them to realize that we love them and that uh, we're here for them. Uh, we pray for them. We pray for Mike McAllister, who just got transferred uh, to CAMC. We pray to ease his heart pain. We pray for Karen. Uh, Father, that you would be with her um, and be with that family, that you would help them uh, to rely on you and for the healing process to begin. For Tommy and Bill Chapman, as they undergo tests, that you would uh, be with that. Uh, help the doctors to find out exactly what the problem is for James and Stephanie Decker Father we pray for James for his back um, Father we pray that you would ease the pain Father most of all we would pray for his salvation that his soul might be uh, softened and his heart might be softened and he might be receptive to the gospel and someone may share the gospel with him uh, that he might realize where he's going to spend eternity Father for Pastor Kevin and Lisa and Melanie and Sharon, as they go to Princeton for the convention, we pray to be with them. Already begin to speak to our hearts and their hearts, Father, that uh, they may make the decisions that would be pleasing with you. For Janet Smith, who just lost her husband, Rick, we pray that uh, you would heal her loneliness and be with her and send the Holy Spirit about her. Uh, Father, we know that you never leave us and you never forsake us. So, Father, we ask that you be with Janet. And for Gloria Ferguson, who has pneumonia, we pray that you would be with that situation. Uh, Father, we pray that you would heal her of pneumonia, ease her pain. Father, we ask now that you bless the service on Sunday. Bless Pastor Kevin as he brings the message to us on Sunday, that you give us receptive minds and receptive hearts. I already begin to deal with people that you have in mind for the service and, and the sermon on Sunday. Father, we ask now that you direct us tonight as we talk about being a risk taker and taking risk as a Christian. We ask now that you bind us in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Uh, before, we had talked about uh, dealing with uh, how we handle crises. The first one we talked about, how Christians handle failure. And then we talked about how Christians handle grief, how they handle panic, and how they handle starting over. Tonight we're talking about risk taking. Risk taking. I want you to think back. And of all your adventures in life, which ones was the most daring? Of all your adventures in life, which ones was the most daring? I haven't lived a very daring life. <laughs> I mean, I play everything pretty close to the vest. Scott, on the other hand, being in the military, it's been pretty daring for him and, and for David, I'm sure. Okay? I think the most daring thing that I ever did is when I was in Huntington in Christian school, we took a youth group to Carter's Cave State Park, and we went spelunking in the caves. And I was down on my knees on the ground in a cave, and it felt like all these rocks were just coming right down on top of me. I was scared to death. I was close to the Lord then. 
Lord, just get me out of here, and I won't come back under the ground again. Unless you call me to be a coal miner, and then I don't want to do that either. Anybody else have anything daring? Scott, you want to share anything that's daring? Anybody else? You ladies haven't done anything daring? Not that you want to talk about? I think the most daring thing my wife had did was walk down the aisle with me. That was a daring thing. Oh, really? That's unusual. If you fall off of that, you're going to be hurting. Riding an elephant? Where did you ride an elephant? They got elephants in Texas? Oh, okay. I was going to say, elephants in Texas. I knew they had longhorns, but I didn't know they had elephants in Texas. Anybody else have anything daring? Oh, yeah. He's, yeah? Swing on the grapevine, go out in the creek? Land over the hill? Which reminds me of the time I took the gymnastics class in college, and they put us on the, the rings, you know, the swinging rings. Well, they didn't tell us when you dismount that you're supposed to pull up like this and then let go, and then you'll fall flat on your feet. Well, I was swinging. I was doing pretty good swinging. I passed the swinging part, but when I dismounted, I didn't pull up like this, and I went, bam, flat on my face. Teacher told me, he said, son, you better find you another class to get into <laughs> That was uh, that was a daring thing. Okay. Yes. Well, I, I'll, and I'll say. Yeah, I will say this. I was daredevil enough when I was in Paris. I did go to the very tip top of the Eiffel Tower. I did do that. That's a good view. It is a good view. I did do that. The only trouble is it's a glass bottom. When you look down, can you see people look like ants down on the bottom? And it sways all the time when you're up there. It sways just like this all the time. Uh, okay, as a kid, who was your favorite ghost? Marley? You know who Marley Ghost Marley was? Oh, come on. You've never seen Scrooge? Or was it Marley? Or was your favorite ghost Marley or Casper? Marley was scary. Casper was and friendly. Right? Yeah. Okay? So we're going to talk about those kind of things tonight, too. Okay? We're going to look at Matthew chapter 14, verses 22. 36, Chuck, I'm sorry. I told you 33, but 36. Matthew 14, 22 to 36. And it says, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. And the boat was already a long, a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch, you know what the fourth watch is? Fourth watch, 24 hours, be the last six hours, right? So on the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a what? Marley or Casper? <laughs> it was a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, 
If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gesenaret, Genesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent word unto all that surrounding district and brought to him all who were sick. And they implored him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak, and as many as touched of it were cured. Okay? Pretty good. A lot of good things in this section. A lot of good things in this section. So, why do you think Jesus, in the very first part of this passage, he says... He immediately made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. This is right after he had just fed the 5,000 with the five loaves and three fishes. So why do you think Jesus dismissed the disciples so abruptly? He had something he wanted to prove to them. Okay. Do you not think that feeding the 5,000 was enough? Maybe not for some of them. Right? Okay, that was my next question. You're reading my notes, Chuckle. Why do you think Jesus wanted to pray alone? Do we ever need that? Yes. Sometimes we think being around 25 or 30 or 40 people, we just need to... When I was teaching school, when I got home, sometimes I would walk in the front door and kick a dog we didn't even have. And I just wanted to be alone sometimes, you know? It just that you just, but here Jesus was. He just fed the 5,000. The disciples were worried we don't have enough food to feed these people. What in the world are we going to do? How are we going to feed all these people? He said, don't worry, I got this. He said, I got this. So now they got a storm coming up. Jesus says, I've got to be alone. I need to be alone. He thinks to himself, I've got to be alone. I've got to go talk to my father. So he wanted to be alone. So he goes up to the mountain to pray. He wanted to be alone. Uh, let's look. Chuck, go to John 6, 15, please. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now this is the same thing that we're talking about here. This is John's version of it. So why might Jesus be tempted by uh, his mounting popularity and the crowd's clamor for a king? How, how do you think Jesus was, was feeling? What does it say? What's the key thing in that verse right there? It says, they were intending to come and take him by force to make him. What kind of king were they looking for? An earthly king. Somebody was going to be a ruler. And, and they were going to force him to be king. Jesus didn't want that. He, didn't, he knew that wasn't his mission. So he went and he got away. He went away. Okay? And, you know, it's, it would have been pretty tempting for Jesus. I'm sure it was a temptation for Jesus to stay and be with that crowd. So how did Jesus respond it, uh, as he did in, remember when he was tempted in the wilderness? How did Jesus respond to Satan? And what did he always use? He always used Scripture. Okay? So this is this. He always prayed to the Father. Every time he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, 
he always prayed to the Father. How does this resemble? What, what did he do this time? He did the same thing, didn't he? He went and he prayed to the Father. How many times do we do that? We need to follow that example, don't we? We do need to follow that example. That's every time we have that happen to us. Okay? Um, while Jesus is up on the mountain, meanwhile, what happens out on the lake to rock the disciples' boat? A storm. A storm. Everything was good, just fed 5,000. How many baskets did they take up at the end? Took up 12 baskets at the end. They had more than enough to feed everybody. Everybody's feeling pretty good about themselves. They just saw Jesus feed the 5,000. Now he wants to go to the Father. He puts the disciples out in the boat. And they're out in the boat for a while until about, what's the sixth hour? What, what would that be, about 6 o'clock? About 6 o'clock, guys start, guy starts getting black. The wind starts blowing, and the boat starts rocking. Okay. Never been on a rocking boat? Only when I was fishing, but it wasn't that much. Little John boat didn't rock very much. Okay? So they get out in the boat. Uh, what happens to stir up their fear, the disciples' fear? The disciples are just on the boat. Just the disciples. Well, what else happens to stir up their fear? Everything's calm, and then all of a sudden, what happens? Up and down. Left and right. Up and down. What do you think they're thinking? We're going to die. We're going to die. Something better happen. Okay? Then what happened to encourage their faith? Okay? What did they think he was first? They thought he was a ghost. They thought he was a ghost. I don't know whether he was transparent or what, and he was only visible to the disciples, but they thought he was a ghost. And who was the first one to recognize him? What do we know about Peter? Peter was always the one that had an open mouth, insert foot, wasn't he? Peter, what do we know about this incident then? That, uh, what do we know about Peter's actions that reveal about his personality? Okay. What else do we realize about Peter's personality? Everybody else was there. What was, the, what was, what was everybody else doing? Everybody else was holding on for dear life. Peter opens his mouth as he usually did. You remember when Jesus was praying in the garden? What was the first thing Peter did when the, when the, when the soldiers came? Yeah, he took out a sword. He cut off Malchus's ear. That was Peter. A lot like us, or a lot like me anyway. I got a big mouth. Peter had a mouth. Sometimes my mouth gets me in a whole lot of trouble. Not just a little bit of trouble, a whole lot of trouble. But Peter, Peter was pretty outspoken. He was pretty brash. Uh, we can get that from, from this. Um, why do you think Jesus invites Peter and us to step out in faith? Isn't that what Jesus did to Peter? Why do you think Jesus asked, told Peter or asked Peter and uh, he asked us to step out in faith? Okay. Do what? Yeah. Increase our faith. Okay. Is that what you said, Rob? See how strong our faith is? 
Okay? Show, okay, it shows us where our comfort zone is, right, Chuck? Shows us where our comfort zone is, right? Okay. Um, so, when did Peter begin to sink? When he did what? He started dining himself, and what did you say, Mel? When he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to what? What happens to us when we take our eyes off Jesus? We sink. And if we're not careful, we sink all the way up to here. Because we'll sink up to here before we'll ask for help. Instead of just getting ankle deep, we wait till we get up neck deep, and then we start asking for help because we think we can do it all by ourselves. Not the case. Not the case. Um, so why do you think Peter sank then and not earlier? He had his eyes where they were supposed to be. And I was doing these notes and stuff, and I thought of the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, Look Full in His Wonderful Face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in light of His glory and grace. We keep our eyes on Jesus. But when we take our eyes off, we are hurting for certain. We can't take our eyes off Jesus. Okay? A lot of things in this... Uh, in this little passage. So what do the disciples conclude about Jesus as a result of, his, of this faith stretching? We all agree that this stretched everybody's faith in Jesus, right? We agree with that? This whole thing stretched everybody's faith? What did the disciples conclude then at the end? Okay, what does it say? Ah, they worship him. Okay. Uh, yeah, they worshipped him and praised him. Okay. And once they got to land, how did the word about Jesus spread? Yeah. We didn't have a television evangelist to tell anybody about him. They didn't have Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff to spread out about Jesus, did they? It's, they spread it by word of mouth. That's the way we need to spread it, too. Now, there's other tools we can use, but I think the most effective, the most effective is by word of mouth. Because then they can see, you can really tell somebody at that point. And all it all is doing to spread the word is tell somebody else what Jesus did for you. That's all you have to do. You don't have to give, oh, he brought me out of drugs and alcohol and this, that, and the other. Nope. What did the blind man say? I know that once I was blind, but now I see. I know that once I was a sinner. Now I know. Now I'm saved. Okay. I know that once I was bound for hell. Now I know I'm going to heaven. And that's all we need to tell anybody. The gospel, death, death, burial, and resurrection. Okay. Um, if you had been in the boat with the disciples, okay. Think about it. You're in the boat with the disciples, and when they saw someone walking on the water. What would you have said? I think I ate too many anchovies. Where's Jesus? I'm seeing things. You say absolutely nothing. Or let me get out of here. Or how does he do that? What do you think you would have said? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Where's Jesus when we need him? 
Okay? Uh, what, was, what was Jesus really saying when he cried out, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid? Was he telling them, Get yourself together. Yoo-hoo, it's only me. Relax. Believe in me. Why are you surprised? You saw me just feed 5,000 people. What do, you think it would, what do you think they said? What was Jesus saying? Yeah, get yourself together. I just fed 5,000. Get yourself together. Yeah. Okay? When Peter replied, uh, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water, what was he really asking for? To have the same power? To see a little proof? To risk? To show off? To get to Jesus or to test his own faith? Okay? Sometimes I think Peter was trying to show off. Because that's just the kind of guy Peter was. He, he was, yeah, he was kind of a show off in a way. Okay? But there's all kinds of little things there. Uh, what was the tone in Jesus' voice when he said, You have little faith? Why did you doubt? Was he, uh, was it disappointment? Like, are you ever going to learn? Or was it concern? What happened? You almost drowned. Or was it anguish? Oh, Peter, I know what you're going through. Or was it anger? Don't ever do that again. Or was it reassurance? You almost made it, and with a little more faith, you will. Yeah. Yeah, the last one. With a little more faith, you will. You almost made it. A little more faith, you will. You ever get to that point where you almost make it? Where you, I, I think of the time I almost hit a home run. I almost made it with a little bit more. If I'd have had me another biscuit that morning for breakfast, I would have probably hit the ball over the fence. But you, a little more faith, and you almost made it, but you just had a little more faith. If Jesus knew Peter was going to sink, why did he invite him to come in the first place? If Jesus knew that Peter was going to sink, why did he ask Peter to come on? Got into the water. Okay? You think he did it to teach Peter a lesson? Could have been. How about to encourage Peter to take risks? Could be. Okay? Okay. Yeah, to test his faith. Taught Peter to test his faith. Or to let Peter fail. I don't think he ever wanted Peter to fail. He didn't want Peter to fail. Exactly. He was doing what? Yeah, it was a picture for the other disciples, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like Fred Sanford, you big dummy. Yeah. Yeah. If you had to compare your strong point and weak point in terms of bone, your strong point and your weak point in terms of bone, what would your strongest bone and weakest bone be? Crazy bone, ham bone, neck bone, back bone, or wish bone? My strongest bone is really not my back bone. I wish for a lot of things. So just, you know, you can think about things like that. When it comes to risking, how would you describe yourself? Cautious, impulsive, calculating, procrastinating, or apprehensive? Well, that's good. Well, you don't know that. You don't know that. Mine is, mine is 
if you look at the flower garden in front of my house, if you look at the flower garden in front of my house, you know mine's procrastinating. I know it needs to be done, but I just don't want to get out there and do it. Whew, poor David. <laughs> and I'm going. To, I'm eventually going to get to it. That, that's what I keep saying. You know, I put it off and put it off and put it off. But a lot of times I am really cautious because I've tried to live by the philosophy: plan your work and work your plan. Before I took any risk that I'm at work that I didn't need to do, before I ever disciplined a, a student, I always thought, "What can happen if I do this, or what can happen if I do that, or what's this parent going to say when I do this, or what?" I know I'm the boss, and I know what I say goes. But I always had, you always had to realize what were the consequences if you went out on a limb and did something with somebody. Oh, you don't know how many times I've had a parent come into my office and say, oh, he's basically a good kid. I said, there's no such thing. They're all born in sin. There's no such thing as a good kid. Well, they disagree with me. But that's, their, that's their prerogative. Uh, where do you feel that God is inviting you to get out of the boat right now? In your job, in your family, in your spiritual walk, or in your future planning? Doing future planning, what have I been afraid to try? Something to think about. Where does God want you to get out of the boat? It can't be my job or career because I'm finished with that. Finished with my job. In my family... I'm not going to start over with anybody after 50 years. That's for sure. My spiritual walk? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're never done with that. That's exactly a good point. Okay? Um, let's go back to this. I want to reflect a little bit. Would you be more likely to stay in the boat or step out of it, and why? If you were in the boat with the disciples, would you be more likely to stay in the boat or step out of it, and why? That's something to think about. Huh. Huh. think you would have taken the risk? It's kind of hard. Exactly. You don't think, you think Peter thought that? You think Peter thought that? If Peter, let me ask you this, I, and I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you. If Peter thought that, why did he take his eyes off Jesus? Do we ever get scared that way? Yeah, that's true. That's true. But Peter didn't put Jesus to the test. Jesus put Peter to the test at that point. So, right. Right, right. You are right. Uh, what do you see in your own life that parallels Peter's attempt to walk on water? In my own life, I would have never dreamed I would ever be in front of a church body people speaking. Ever, ever, ever in my life. Did I ever think that? I was as bashful if you 
somebody looked at me and said this and that, and I turned red-faced. It was bashful as can be, believe it or not. I was very, very bashful, very, very backward. Uh, somewhat, yeah. And the more, the more speech class I took, it, but what really turned me around is when I really realized that what I have in my heart I need to share with other people. And being in Campus Crusade for Christ and doing one-on-one -on -one evangelism on the, on, on the Christian campus kind of got me through that. So, but I would have never believed I'd be doing such a thing. All right, four things, if you want to write these down, I always leave you with something to write down. Four things to remember about this passage. Number one, Chuck, I should have had these on a, <laughs> on a slide, shouldn't I? But I, I just didn't have, with taking care of Debbie, I didn't have time to get over here and get it done. First thing, obeying God can sometimes lead to rough sailing. Obeying God can sometimes lead to rough sailing. We've all been there. And the thought came to mind of Pastor Kevin and Lisa when they had to leave First Baptist of Fairly. They obeyed God what he wanted them to do, but boy, it was rough sailing there for a while for them. Obeying God sometimes or can lead to rough sailing. Second thing, Peter was the only one who got out of the boat to attempt the impossible. Other ones stared at him. Peter was the only one who got out of the boat. Wonder why Thomas didn't get out of the boat. Thomas was a what? He was a doubter. Matthew probably didn't get out of the boat because there weren't any taxes there to be there weren't any taxes to collect. Okay. It's daddy's girl. Yeah. I, 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 I. <laughs> okay. Peter was the only one who got out of the boat in an attempt to do the impossible. And now they're stared at him. Number three, this is probably a, an important one. Jesus rebuked Peter for having little faith, not for having no faith. Peter did have faith, but Jesus rebuked him for having little faith, not for having no faith at all. He didn't say, oh, ye of no faith. He said, oh, ye of little faith. Yes, I sure can. Jesus rebuked Peter for having little faith, not for having no faith. And number four, it has two parts. Number four, the disciples worshipped him and declared truly you are the Son of God. The disciples worshipped him and declared truly, you are the Son of God. The second part of that, I keep forgetting you come from, I keep forgetting you come from Harrison County and you can't write very fast. That's okay. <laughs> Wetzel County. Wetzel, Harrison, that's, you know, they're right there together. So, Corey comes from Harrison County. So, <laughs> and 
and declared, truly, you are the Son of God. You think they had their doubts before the time in the boat? I mean, just, they just saw him feed 5,000 people. How soon they forget? Like us? How soon do we forget? How soon do we forget? Yes. Good point, Tony. And the second part of the fourth one is Jesus wants you to discover Jesus wants you to discover that he is bigger than your fears and wants you to praise him. Jesus wants you to discover that he is bigger than your fears and wants you to praise him. Got it? Get it? Got it. Okay. Uh, don't forget service on Sunday morning. Um, if you happen to miss the thing you service on last Sunday evening, it was a, they were great. They were good. They were good. Yes. That was, and it was a different kind of. I told Pastor Kevin this. Kind of made me feel bad. They're they're worship. They're professional worship leaders. You know. And I can't carry a tune in a bucket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, I thought, wow. I wish if we could have him to lead worship service here at Lighthouse. I'm sure the worship service would be better, but. Then somebody came to me and said, God didn't call them here. He called you. <laughs> so, um, so let's remember service. Uh, I'm sure Pastor Kevin will have some things to share, and Melanie and, and Sharon will have things to, to share. Get some books. They'll have books. Lifeway will have a table there. It's got all kinds of good books. Get you some books. I've read more books since I've been substitute teaching than I have since I've been retired. I've, and I've only subbed two days this year. So, um, women's Bible study next Monday, next Monday night is women's Bible study. And then we're back here again next Wednesday. Uh, small group, Sunday night. In chapter 4, you bring a chili. What you said. I'm expecting chili. I'm just kidding. No, it doesn't matter about the food. We got God's word. We got God's word to feed on. It don't matter about that. Okay. Yeah. I'm just kidding, Roxanne. I'm, I'm just kidding. Yes, chapter four is a great chapter. A church member. I am a church member. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for the time we've had tonight. Thank you that you love us. Father, help us not to take our eyes off of you. Because when we take our eyes off you, we're like Peter. We sink. Um, Father, sometimes our faith gets tested. And that's when we need to keep our eyes on you. Uh, Father, we just ask now that you'd be with us, be with our pastor and our leaders, that you'd be with them, uh, be with each and every household here this evening. And Father, bring us back on Sunday that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen.